Thank you. And so item number three on the agenda is to review, um, ask if there's any request to revise the agenda, and then just to approve the agenda um, as it has been sent out for um, notification to the public. I'm looking for any blue hands on Zoom from trustees, and I don't see any hands raised in the boardroom. So we will go ahead and um, stick with the agenda as it has been sent out. So number four is to approve the minutes from the Board of Trustees regular meeting of September 22nd, 2020. Are there any requests for any modifications to those minutes? Not seeing any hands raised in either place. So is there a motion to approve the minutes from the regular meeting on September 22nd? Moved by Trustee Oldperson and seconded by Trustee Lorenzen. All trustees in favor, either say aye or raise your hand. So my hand is up and I'll say aye, and I'm just counting. Don't go on yet. Okay, and Trustee Decker, I don't see a hand up or down. Okay, thank you. So the motion passes and the minutes have been approved. Now we come to the time for public comment on non-agenda items. Those are items that we won't be talking about as an agenda item tonight. We ask, well, it's gotten a little more complicated, but we ask folks who wanna make public comment on non-agenda items to state your first and last name, add any spelling if there's an unusual spelling to either your first or last name. If you represent an organization, identify that organization. And we ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. And with that, um, two things. If you raise your hand on Zoom, then a blue hand will show up in a certain queue order. So we will call on folks as blue hands go up on Zoom. So I'm just looking to see, are there any hands up? Okay, so we don't have any hands up at this point. And there is um, written correspondence that's, that is included in our agenda. So now we move on to our student trustee reports. And I'm excited to introduce everyone, including on Zoom, and in listening in the, in the community to our new student trustees. We do have two returning trustees from Sealy Swan. I'm not sure if they were able to attend tonight because connectivity is a little bit challenging. But we have um, Jaden Bead from Big Sky High School, Waverly Winter from Hellgate High School, Malone Ingram from Sentinel High School, and Daisy Kalina from Sentinel High School, and Mariposa Ristau from Willard Alternative Program. And so we had an orientation at 5.30, so I'm gonna switch the order. So Mariposa, do you want to give your report about Willard first? And I'll let you know if you can get a little closer to your microphone, it was a little hard to hear you during the 5.30 section. So wanna tell us what's going on at Willard? It's still pretty quiet. Okay. Hmm. I don't really know. Well, I'll just, I'll just go for it. Um, well, from my observation. Yep, it, it, you're coming in a little better. So go ahead and give us your report. Okay. Willard uh, has been running super smoothly these past couple months or month. And Everyone seems to be respecting the rules in place um, to keep everyone safe. Um, this year, I have noticed that the staff has been very warm and welcoming and understanding of all that everyone has been going through. And it's been a great space in Willard. Um, I feel that the staff at Willard treat me as an individual human being rather than just another piece of the system or the student body as a whole. And for that, I have a lot of appreciation for the program of Willard. Thank you. Thanks, and then if Malone and Daisy, I don't know how you've divided up your report, but do you wanna tell us about Sentinel High School? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you all are enjoying the fall weather. Once again, my name is Daisy Kalina, and I'm here today with my co-trustee, Malone Ingram, also from Sentinel. 
At Sentinel, we're continuing to progress through our block schedule, and as of this week, we're beginning our third block. This fall, Sentinel has been busy with many events, socially distanced, of course. For, all, for our fall sports updates, uh, boys golf has had an exceptional season this year, taking first at state. Last Friday, we won our homecoming game um, against Hellgate 64 to zero. And this Thursday's game against Helena will be the senior night for the football team. On Saturday, uh, girls soccer played Helena. They lost, although it was still a close game. And our boys soccer team tied Helena. Uh, our soccer teams are now gearing up for playoffs this week. And then for cross country at the 7 of 7 um, meet, also on Saturday, the girls took fourth while the boys took first place. Cross country has one more home meet before we head to Kalispell for state. And now I'll turn the rest of the report over to Malone. Thank you. We can't hear you too well, Malone. Is there a way to... Um, there. Is that better? That's way better. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. So again, I'm Malone Ingram from Sentinel. And um, while sports are in full swing, clubs and school events are too. Last week was our Spartan Pride Week. So Sentinel students wore their purple and gold, which led up to our homecoming football game on Friday. Sentinel's clubs have been very, very busy as well. Student government is designing a senior shirt for the class of 2021, along with our senior legacy project and other exciting school events. Key Club has elected officers and is ramping up this week. Amnesty International will hold its first meeting next Tuesday. Theater Club has begun and is looking for new members to join. The National Honor Society held its first meeting last week and is looking forward to a great year of volunteering around the community. Speech and debate practice was scheduled to start last week, but in hopes of having a more normal season, it has been pushed to December. Model United Nations is starting up again next week in preparation for a remote conference in mid-November. And our school newspaper, The Spartan Scoop, will, will release its first issue next week. Um, in other news, Sentinel seniors took the ACT last Tuesday and juniors will be taking the PSAT this week. Um, thank you so much for your time tonight and hearing about what Sentinel has in store this year. Daisy and I look forward to continuing the year as Sentinel trustees and working with the board more, as well as engaging in our school community. Thank you, great to hear about Sentinel and let's now hear about Hellgate High School, Waverly. Hello, I'm, Hel I'm Waverly Winter and I'm from Hellgate. Um, we started off the school year really well. Everybody was really happy to be back at school. It was a bit of a transition to get used to the block schedule, but everybody is really liking the 10 a.m. start. Um, uh, a lot of people uh, in sports are getting in full swing. And just today, the girls soccer team won five one against Flathead in their playoff game and now we're gonna play on Saturday either against Billings or Bozeman. And tonight also the boys soccer team played against Big Sky and they're playing against them right now and they're probably just getting finished up with that. Last Friday was a football game against Sentinel and we unfortunately lost. But that was our first um, football game that our sports event that students could go to and we socially distanced and it was a really fun night. Um, and cross country is going to state soon and golf finished up their uh, season. As for clubs, SAVE is right now is working on finishing up our greenhouse, working on how to collect compost and recycling and working on fundraising. NHS earlier this fall um, uh, weeded and cleaned our courtyard and now Hellgate's courtyard looks great. And now we're working on new fundraising ideas and um, not fundraising, but volunteer ideas. And student government is working on how to make the, is working on making bulletin boards around the school to decorate and working on how to support sports 
COVID safely. And um, a lot of other clubs are meeting and getting together and working on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. And now let's hear about Big Sky. Jaden. Hi there. My name is Jaden Bead, and um, I'm the trustee for Big Sky High School. So just as um, a little bit of an overview, I'll be going over just some general things about Big Sky um, and then going into uh, how our athletics activities and clubs are doing. So first, um, construction has finally wrapped up at Big Sky. Two weeks ago, they finished our new sod on our practice football fields. There are also three new CTE spaces. One is for industrial arts, one is for, for culinary, and another is our new media lab. We are currently still in our third block of classes, which is period fifth and sixth, and we will switch to seventh and eighth next week. The blocks are 11 days long for each class at Big Sky. Our counselors are starting to offer social and emotional lessons such as organization and prioritization, coping with stress, staying engaged, and these are through our um, grade level Google Classrooms to be provided to students. They also have created these lessons based on a needs assessment that was sent out to all students. Last week was our homecoming and we were able to have a couple of dress up days that each cohort got to participate in. The first being a work from home day where essentially you dressed in pajamas from the waist down and you dressed in professional attire from the waist up. And then our second day was our blue and gold or our big sky pride day. Um, and we saw a lot of success with that. A lot of kids were really happy that we got to even do it at all and were really involved and we got a lot of positive feedback and felt that it was a success. We also concluded student government elections and homecoming royalty, which were announced on um, the blue and gold day of both cohorts. Then uh, we, as we're all adjusting to the new schedule and various challenges that come along with it, we are now offering a zero period to support students academically. During this time, students can attend on their alpha day from 8 to 9.30 a.m. before their first period, and they can get support on work that they're missing, if they're in athletics or if they're out sick, or if they just need extra help with the material in a specific class. And how we're coping with the number of kids versus the number of teachers who are helping out with that time is we're actually looking for um, upperclassmen peer tutors. So there was a survey sent out to teacher nominated students throughout the school, um, mostly juniors and seniors who can help out with various um, in academic areas, whether that be mathematics, science, etc. And then those students will come in in order to help support those teachers and the students needing the help on those days. As far as athletics activities and clubs, our clubs are not in full swing yet. There are a few that have started up, but really most of them will start this week. I know for a fact, National Honor Society has their first meeting tomorrow and um, none others have been set in stone yet. However, um, our Big Sky Fall Athletics program are in full swing and are soon going to be wrapping up. We're proud of our Big Sky athletes because Big Sky coaches and our athletic community have supported us. And as a result, um, we have seen a significant impact in keeping our students healthy and playing longer. Um, and as a result, no Big Sky athlete has had a confirmed positive COVID case at all during this fall season, which we have seen as a huge success and are extremely proud of, especially given how challenging that can be. We are, as I said, winding down our fall athletic season now. So Big Sky Golf ended their season on October 1st. Big Sky Soccer playoffs are this week with Hellgate hosting Big Sky Boys Soccer today and Sentinel will be hosting Big Sky Girls Soccer soon. Soccer's postseason games are single elimination and MHSA has determined that there will be a spectator allowance of two spectators per uniformed athlete for both home and visiting teams. Football playoffs will begin on October 30th with volleyball playoffs beginning November 3rd. And finally, Big Sky Cross Country will have their state meet in Kalispell on October 24th. Winter athletics, boys and girls basketball, wrestling and swimming are set to begin practice on November 19th and MHSA has determined that the speech and debate season will begin on December 1st and are meeting to discuss other areas of winter seasons for which we will receive further guidance. And um, I think that about wraps up our uh, report from Big Sky, but I just want to say how thankful I am once again for all of you here today um, who are willing to listen to a student's point of view on every individual school because I believe that it provides very important insight into um, all of our student lives, which are more important now than ever. Thank you. Thank you to um, 
Jaden and to all the trustees, it's very heartening to hear that in this time of complete unnormalcy, the, the efforts to remain normal and on track, but also creative, um, is incredibly impressive. So we really, especially I think this year, appreciate the student trustee reports. It really um, makes it clear that everyone values public education and most of all the students are letting us know how valuable it is in their lives. So thanks so much. And with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Watson for his announcements. <clears throat> okay, thank you Chair Holland for uh, just uh, giving me a few minutes this evening. Um, first, just like to say thank you again to our student trustees. Thanks for your input and your reports. As always, very detailed and um, interesting for us to hear. I also um, would like to just uh, give a quick shout out to not only to our students for persevering during this difficult time and being um, compliant with, with our procedures and protocols, but also uh, being very resilient with all the changes this fall. I really appreciate everything that the students are doing. I also uh, would just hearing the student reports this evening, I also think it's important to say thank you to our teaching staff and our classified staff and our administrative staff um, who've all worked very, very hard to make the school somewhat normal and have some things that um, students have expected in the past and seen in the past and, and still try to persevere through all the changes. But um, it's heartening to hear that there are some efforts and I knew there would be, but there's some great efforts by our staff to really um, have students welcome in the building and, and, and back in the building and, and provide a little bit of normal, normal activities. So thank you to our staff for that. Um, I have one announcement for the board this evening regarding a, a slight change in our um, fall calendar that I just wanted to make the board aware of. Uh, we traditionally have uh, parent-teacher conferences uh, the first or second week of November towards the end of the quarter. Um, in looking at our calendar this fall, we've had so many weeks that have been broken up that we thought it would be best to move those parent-teacher conferences uh, a little bit later in the calendar. So um, we've moved those parent-teacher conferences off of November 12th and 13th. We've moved them to the two days before Thanksgiving break. We thought that would provide some better continuity for for um, our entire district as we proceed through these weeks, of, these first few weeks of school. The parent-teacher conferences will be held virtually um, rather than in person. And we felt like um, having those two days before Thanksgiving break for conferences uh, would be beneficial. So we've made that switch. Uh, we tried to get that word out to our parents, but I wanted to make sure the board was aware of that. Uh, two other things just to be aware of. This week we celebrate, uh, or we, usually would go to um, MCEL, that's the, that is the, um, the <clears throat> conference for school boards and administrators, um, happens every October. And in, in that vein, we would be celebrating a few things there. I just want to bring this to the board's attention. So uh, number one celebration, um, our school district and in fact our school board um, will be receiving the Golden Gavel Award and it sounds pretty cool and there's a really cool plaque that goes with it uh, with the actual golden gavel on it so we'll be able to uh, uh, hang that plaque in our new boardroom but the, I just wanted to make you aware of why we're receiving this. The golden gavel award is bestowed on those school districts whose entire board became certified in the same 12 month period. So certification process through the Montana School Boards Association um, is how this happened. All the award winners will be named and posted on the MCEL and the MTSBA website and recognized in their newsletter. And then they're going to be mailing our award plaque um, to the district following MCEL. So I, I do want to say thank you to our school board. I know that sometimes participating in trainings or participating in state level meetings is, is above and beyond what we ask you to do. But just want to know that your efforts are, are being recognized and rewarded. And then there's one other award that, that we'll receive or uh, one, one person on the board will receive at MCEL and that's the Marvin Heinz Award. The Marvin Heinz Award is bestowed on those individual board members 
who've reached the highest level of trustee certification through the school board academy program for the training um, that they've taken. And uh, th this year, the Marvin Heinz Award will be going to Marsha as the board chair. And um, just excited that this will be presented to her and, and for all of her work and efforts. So those are my two quick announcements. So thank you for allowing me to chime in. And I just noticed that Eric Lorenz from Seeley Swan has jumped in on the call. So if we can, if Eric, you are there to give the student trustee report from Seeley, would you be able to do that now? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Can you thank you. Hear me? Happy Tuesday, everyone. Um, Claire is not here, but I am. So. <laughs> We appreciate it. Swan. Uh, first of all, we'd like to say how great it is to be back. Hopefully, our senior year won't be, will not be uh, further disrupted by coronavirus, but we will take what we get. Last week, City Swan High School celebrated homecoming. We had Spirit Week filled with fun dress up days, sign making, games, athletic competitions. Seniors were winning last we heard, but we don't know the, res the results yet. Regardless, uh, students had fun, it was exciting, safe, and it was a great homecoming. Both volleyball and football teams finished off the, te week, the week with a win. Ladies Hawk won their only games this week in three sets. Uh, they are so far num seeded number two in the district. Our football team beat the Derby Tigers 14-8, to eight, adding to a record of two wins and four losses, unfortunately. Uh, our last home game is this Friday versus our Lee uh, student council and Leo's club are back to normal student council is getting busy planning uh, spirit games and dress up things all week uh, and Leo's club is working on the first project painting the school's recycling cans uh, and soon we'll be re-electing or electing representatives and board members in the groups. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I just want to say, you know, tell um, Mr. Palmer and Claire and the rest of the school, we wish we could do our second school board meeting of the year up in Sealy, but right now everything is um, kind of taking it slow. So we only wish we could see you in person at some point. But thank you for the report and thank you for being here. All right. Thank you. You bet. And so now moving on to the agenda items. Item number seven is the consent agenda. And I apologize, I didn't catch this when we were or asking for revisions to the agenda. But if you look at page 89, it is all elementary students. And if you look at 90, it's high school students for um, acknowledging that student attendance agreements where students have requested to go to other schools. So I'm just going to break that into two different items. So we would vote on, on them as two different items. And then the third item is students who are requesting um, to go to MCPS schools. So as items on the consent agenda, we don't have board discussion because these are things we see in a routine fashion. Any trustee who wants to talk about anything on the um, consent agenda can simply ask to take it off but I'll just look and see if anyone's hand is to take any of these agreements off and see none. Then um, is there a motion to, I have to get the right words. Is there a motion to acknowledge the attached list of elementary students requested to attend other school districts found on page 89 from a K-12 trustee? Moved by trustee Lorenzen, is there a second? Um, second by Trustee Abgaris. As I indicated, there is no board comment. Any public comment of a general nature, we don't comment on any specific individual students. Seeing no hands up, then all K-12 trustees in favor of the motion to acknowledge the attached list of elementary students requesting to attend other school districts, please indicate by raising your hand either virtually or on the screen. And let me... I saw that there's a name, Vicki, that has joined. I don't know if that's Trustee McDonald or if that's a different Vicki. Trustee McDonald, are you on Zoom? 
not seeing any hands raised. So, so if you don't mind raising your hands one more time, just so I can count. And Trustee Decker, did you have your hand up or not? Okay, thanks. I just I was looking in two places. So it passes unanimously as to all trustees, K, um, 12 trustees present. Then we go on to 90, which is high school students. So that is a motion to acknowledge, it, it says approve, but acknowledge the out of district, um, the request to attend other schools by high school students. Is there a motion to do so? Moved by Trustee Abgaris. Is there a second? Seconded by Trustee Lorenzen. Again, we will not be commenting on it. Any public comment of a general nature? Not seeing any hands up. Then all trustees in favor of the motion to acknowledge the list of students, high school students requesting to attend other school districts, please indicate by raising your hand. And Trustee Vogel? Vogel is a yes. Thank you. And so that is unanimous as to all trustees present. Then we move on to the second item under the consent agenda, which is to ratify out of district attendance agreements. And this also is an elementary action item. And the recommendation is that the trustees ratify um, the attached out of district elementary attendance agreements. Is there such a motion? Moved by Trustee Olperson and seconded by Trustee Avgaris. Again, there won't be board discussion. Any public comment of a general nature? Not seeing any hands up. Then all K-12 trustees in favor of the motion to ratify the out of district attendance agreements found on page 91, please indicate by raising your hand. And it looks like it's unanimous as to all trustees, K-12 trustees present. Then we move on to old business under teaching and learning. As we had discussed at prior board meetings, we will be bringing back on somewhat of a regular basis updates on the impact that COVID-19 is having on the district. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Watson. And I think you have some others also going to be providing information. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Holland. Um, we've got... Uh, about six items that I just want to update the board on this evening. And um, two of them I'm going to ask for help from, uh, from two people that are on Zoom. So Amy Shattuck should be on Zoom. I think I saw her earlier. Amy is our federal programs director. And then the other person that I think is by phone this evening with us is Ginny Haynes. And Ginny Haynes is our special education director. Ginny, are you on with us? Maybe. Hi, this is Jenny. I am on by phone. Thank you, Jenny. I'll be with you in just a second. So um, I'm going to share my screen. So for those board members that are in the room, it should come up up there. But for those that are at home, you should be able to see it. Um, let's see. You should be able to see it on your screen at home. So this is a link to um, to a spreadsheet that is on our website. So under our um, general web page, there's a link on the right-hand side that says COVID-19. If you click on that, it takes you to this page, our COVID-19 page. At the very top link up here is MCPS district-wide COVID data. This is something that we are updating every week. Um, you can see that the numbers are sorted by school. These are summary data on confirmed cases. And then what we do is we break it down by sort of by grade level band. So we've got K5, 6, 8, 9, 12, as well as by staff, the numbers for staff. So that number 41 represents all the confirmed cases um, that we're aware of from 826 to 1011. And I say that because generally speaking, uh, we are made aware of cases of students or staff that are presently working in our schools or attending schools. If a student is in the MOA, the online academy, we wouldn't necessarily know if they're positive or not positive because they're not present in our schools. And so the health department has been uh, giving us information about positive cases when kids are, are in schools. I wanted to point out just a couple of other data pieces that we've added since last time I showed you this. 
Um, one of the questions I frequently get um, regarding our positive cases is, do we have any idea where they contracted or where the transmission occurred? So we added this cause of transmission by, this is a total percentage of all the cases. When, and, and this is determined through case investigation when our health services supervisor talks with the individual case um, and asks some questions about, you know, where they might have trans, um, where the transmission might have occurred. So, um, again, this is through investigation and interview with the confirmed case. So we estimate about 17% of our cases uh, were caused by transmission through a school activity or, or at the school, 81% transmission outside of the school. So something that happened outside of the school, either a positive family member or a positive friend that they were with, um, and then about 2% of unknown cause of transmission. Uh, the other thing that I, I frequently get asked about, so even though it shows 41 cases, that's since the beginning of the school year. So people frequently ask me, well, you know, what percentage of that 41 are currently active cases? And so we, we did an estimate on that as well, looking at the case data that we have. So out of the 41 cases, we estimate, and this was as of Sunday, so this it gets updated every Sunday, but as of Sunday, we estimated we had about 12 of those cases that were still active. Um, so what, one thing that, um, that I am gonna continue to report to the board too is the active cases in the county. And this can be found on the county website. And they actually divide it by active cases per 100,000. And I took one more step. I, calculated the active cases per 10,000 in the county. And I'll tell you why I did that is because if you add our students and our staff and you take out the MOA students, but if you add students and staff minus the MOA students, we're, we're at about 9,000, just under 9,000. So if you consider that our school district is sort of a subset or a uh, sort of a subset or representation of our county. We have about 9,000 people in our district um, and it's sort of a subset of the county. So I, I wanted to show this just for comparison's sake. If we look at the active cases as of Sunday, we had about 44 active cases per 10,000. So um, if, if our district is a microcosm of the county, we, we could expect up to 44 active cases in our district uh, but we're not seeing that right now. As of Sunday, we were seeing 12 active cases. So um, I don't know what that means. I'm not, I'm not an expert by any means in this um, epidemiology of this. I just want to point out to the, to the board that, you know, all things being equal, we could expect as many as 44 active cases based on the number of active cases in the county, but uh, we're not seeing that currently. And we'll continue to update that every Sunday the number of active cases will change for us, and then the number of active cases in the county will also change as the days go on. So that's all available on our website. Uh, we'll continue to keep that updated. Wanted to point that out. The other thing that um, <clears throat> I'll report verbally too is, I, I mentioned this at the last meeting, in addition to the confirmed cases, we also have a lot of students and staff members that are considered close contacts either because they are close contacts to a confirmed case in school or they're a close contact to a confirmed case outside of school. And we're looking at that every week. For about the last two weeks, we've averaged 100 students or staff, 100 students and staff together um, total, averaged 100 um, that were considered close contacts. And that's across all schools, all levels. That isn't localized at any one school, but District-wide, we have about 100 students and staff on, um, on that close contact list. And then we've been averaging that for a couple of weeks now. And I report that out because that does impact our abilities to you know, move forward with education. So when you have a student that's on quarantine because they're a close contact, that means they're not in school, obviously. And so we have to do um, some extra things to keep them up you know, going on and, and keep them updated with, with school. So we're gonna keep tracking that as well, but 
as of the last couple of weeks, we've had about 100 students and staff on, uh, on that close contact list. All right, so the next thing I want to show you is something that the board requested, and that was um, information on food service. So um, Stacy Ross Miller is our food service supervisor and uh, done a, just an excellent job gathering this data for me. Really appreciate, because she's got lots of other stuff going on right now, as you can imagine, but I asked her to do some comparisons with this August and last August, this September and last September. So once we finished the month of September, it helped to uh, have this data done. And so what she looked at, this is total um, meals served. So it's not numbers of students, it's total meals served during the month of August. Breakfast, total breakfast served during the month of August, total lunches served during the month of August. So this is in 2019, and then this is the next line down is 2020. And if you go to September, that's when the numbers really get large. You're looking at 47,000 breakfasts that, breakfast that we served in 2019 in the month of September. And you can see the comparisons there for the month of September this year. One of the things I thought would be helpful is to adjust this based on, on our enrollment, because we have about 80% of our kids attending school versus last year. So we have 20% we have of our kids in the MOA and about 80% of our kids are actually attending school. So I basically adjusted the numbers, last year's numbers, I adjusted them down to 80% versus 100%. So it did, um, it gives you a more realistic picture. Like, you know, currently we have about 7,400 students attending school not 9,300 students. So I adjusted that down just sort of for an apples to apples comparison. But we are um, serving fewer meals this year, both in August and September, both breakfast and lunch. And then the last thing I um, asked her to look at was our bus service. So you remember we served um, meals by bus in April. We did it in March and May as well, but April was the solid month where I could compare April to April. So I asked her to compare 2019 April, breakfast and lunch meals served versus 2020 when we were serving uh, breakfast and lunch by bus. And so I just wanted to give those comparisons as well. So the board had asked for those numbers and wanted to make sure we had those and we'll get this information up on our website as well tomorrow so that folks can take a look at those numbers and, and dive into those a little bit. The next thing I wanted to talk about was mental health services, and then I'll stop and pause for questions before we move to the STAR data. So one of the other things that um, we talked about was, um, you know, services for, for, for mental health. And so um, just, a, just a reminder about this, and I know this is really hard to see, so let me see if I can blow it up a little bit. Doesn't look like I can. Um, Jenny Haynes is on the phone. She's going to talk through this. I apologize, the numbers are pretty small, but I'm going to try to get this opened in a different document. But, Jenny, the first chart that I have up is the CSCT clients um, by per team. And so, Jenny, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like you to just describe to the board what you know, what the CSCT is and what they do for our district and how we, how we, um, how we consider mental health services for our students. I would be happy to do that. Um, so CSCT stands for Community, Comprehensive School and Community Treatment, and it's a school-based behavioral health service um, for children with serious emotional disturbance. Um, CSCT is um, defined in the administrative rules of Montana and it's defined as a comprehensive planned course of community mental health outpatient treatment provided in cooperation and under written contract with the school district where the youth attend school. And currently Missoula County Public Schools is in partnership primarily with Western Montana Mental Health Center. We also this year um, entered into a partnership with Dan Fox um, Youth Program, which is also called the Youth Home. 
and they are supporting one of our schools. But the majority of our schools are supported through Western Mountain and Mental Health. And CSCT is designed as a tier three service. So I know that over the years, you all have heard a lot of information about multi-tiered systems of support. So we've got tier one, which are considered universal supports that are available to all students throughout the district. Tier two are supports that are more intensive for students who are showing um, possibly some needs in certain areas. So tier two becomes a little bit more individualized and based on um, what individual students may need. Um, and is not necessarily intended to be long-term. Tier two is intended to be um, supports that move in around that student and then hopefully can pull back. And then tier three are those services that support social, emotional, behavioral, and academic success for students who are in crisis. Um, with regard to CSDT, the students must also meet the criteria for serious emotional disturbance through um, DSM-5. So right now, um, we have CSDT services at school primarily. They can also happen in the home or in the community. Um, CSCT services currently serve youth through from kindergarten through um, high school. We have individual services, group, and family therapy. Our CSCT staff provide behavioral interventions and other evidence and research-based practices. And right now, our teams in our schools are comprised of a licensed mental health practitioner and a behavioral behavioral specialist. Um, so that's kind of an overview of CSCT. What Rob had asked for some information on is kind of a comparison of what we're looking at right now for the beginning of the school year versus what we look things looked like a year ago. And those are those charts that you're seeing in front of you. So that first chart is, I believe, Rob, you had said it's the client number average. Is that correct? That's correct, yep. Okay. So what I'd like you to hone in on is the September comparison at this point. Um, so what you can see is a year ago for each team throughout the district, this is a district average, those teams averaged 11.4 clients. We've definitely seen a drop as we're in a hybrid phased situation um, where our average client number right now is at 8.1. That's about a 29% drop in clients um, between 19 and 2019 and 2020. Um, part of that has to do with um, just some of the challenges I think tied around COVID where our CSCT teams are struggling to get into contact with families. We've had families move, um, inconsistent commitment from families. Um, and, and just, you know, things are, things are hard. There's a lot of burden on people. And so we've definitely seen that impact the number of clients um, referrals are also somewhat down, which ties into this number. And that um, can be both a positive and a negative. Um, the, the positive side of that is that we may be seeing fewer referrals because for our in-person students, the class to uh, the student to adult ratio is diminished. So we have classroom teachers who are having greater opportunity to respond to behavioral needs for our students. Um, counselors in buildings are um, having um, increased opportunities due to the lower numbers on those A days and B days. And then Rob, do you want to pull up that next slide or do you want me to answer any questions? Or what would you like me to do at this point? Sorry, Jenny, just give me 30 seconds and we'll move on to the next one. You bet.
so just for the board's uh, um, guidance here. So the previous slide was the average number of clients per CSCT team. And Jenny may have mentioned this, but we, we have CSCT teams in every school. And some schools have multiple CSCT teams. Um, but the previous slide was the average number of, of students um, tied to each team. This particular slide is the average number of build um, build units. So Ginny will explain that one. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. So a billable unit is defined as a 15 minute time frame. And for each client, a team has up to 720 billable units that can be um, provided for that client. So if you look again at the September graph there, you'll see that in September of 2019, the teams, and again, these are the teams across the district, were averaging 680 billable units per client. We've definitely seen a decrease in that. We're currently at, for the month of September of 2020, we were at 251 billable units per client. And this is something that I'm going to be working with Western Montana Mental Health and our building principals to do a deeper dive into. That's a 63% drop between last year and this year in billable units. And again, some of that can be attributed to our health and safety measures. We have half of the students on the A days, half on the B days, so that cuts those billable units because we're not seeing students every day. Um, and we're seeing some improved behavior in some classes, so a little bit less need uh, for students in crisis. Um, but we are needing to take a look at that because a drop in billable units does have the potential to affect the ability of the contractor or Western Montana Mental Health to maintain the number of teams that they currently have. Because without those billable units, to Medicaid, the, we're not getting that um, billing back to be able to keep those teams flush. And so that's something that we're going to be looking at and trying to be creative about how we can make sure that we are accessing all of the students who need those services and that we're also keeping health and safety at the forefront, but we're also being thoughtful and creative in how we can provide um, extended services to our students and one thing to know too is that the CSCT services are available to our in-person students as well as our online Academy students so the teams uh, the CSCT teams are working really hard to ensure that those services are available for all of our students regardless of programmatically how they're moving forward this fall thank you all right, so for the board, we've talked about the confirmed case data, uh, food service participation, and mental health services uh, participation. I wanna pause there um, just because the next item is our STAR, our academic data, and, and Amy's gonna um, need to share her screen in a second here to talk about that. But I just wanna pause on those first three to see if there's any board questions for either myself or Ginny. Thank you, Chair Holland. Dr. Watson, um, what, so the numbers of confirmed cases is updated every Sunday night. If a parent wanted live current numbers, is that something you're able to give to them? Because from what you showed, two schools that my children attend, I got notification for yesterday and today. So I know that number is obviously dated, but is that something you would give to parents if they wanted current live numbers? Yes, so what we do is as soon as we're notified during, a, during the school week, we send that letter out to parents at the individual school. And we can always provide that live information, but um, I've gone to just updating that spreadsheet once a week just because there's so many things that come in over the weekend. And I've, what I found was I was updating it um, 
you know, constantly and changing it. So I'm, I'm trying to be consistent and do it once a week. But yes, you're, you're right. We're, we have more cases this week. And by this Sunday, we'll, they'll, they'll be on that spreadsheet. Any other questions? I'm looking for those participating online. Not seeing any hands up. Oh, Trustee Olperson. I have a couple. Okay, so my other question is, your average of 100 students and staff in quarantine because they're in close contact, how is the district supporting those students and staff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so our students that are that might be considered close contacts, they're either in self quarantine, um, you know, maybe a parent makes a decision to do that, or they've been asked to quarantine by the county health office. So there's a couple of different things there. So when I report the hundred, that includes both of those students and staff. What I would tell you is um, for students that are in quarantine or they're on self quarantine at home, um, the teachers are doing a great job in providing work for those students and figuring out ways to check in with those students. Um, it's not perfect, but it's very similar to if a student were at home sick for an extended period of time and they needed to keep up with their work. So um, I think the teachers are doing an outstanding job, but it's, it's, it, of course it's not perfect. The staff members that might be in quarantine, um, Dave could allude to, to, could speak more in detail to this, but basically what we try to do is figure out a way to, if, if they're not sick, first of all, if they're just in quarantine, but maybe they're not sick, we try to figure out a way to keep them engaged in work. What I've seen around the district is you may have a staff member that zooms in and per, still participates with their class. Um, so we have another adult in the room and the staff member is on Zoom and they're still participating as much as they can, assuming they're not sick. Obviously, if they're at home sick, we don't, we don't want, you know, we don't want them put any extra stress on them. But if they're just in quarantine and they're not sick, we try to figure out a way to keep them engaged with the class. Um, for a couple of reasons, it really um, helps the students to see their teacher and, and keeps the teacher engaged as well. So that's generally our accommodations for students and staff that are on quarantine. Any other questions on th these three um, reports? Trustee Olperson? And then Trustee Decker. Okay, and then my final question I had, while you're giving your report, I was taking notes. But in the first slide, it showed 17%, I think is the percentage for school activity. And I do know that one of the student trustees talked about um, MHSA for winter sports, but where it was actually pushed back a few weeks to December 7th. Do you, as a football mom, how um, do we see that changing, I think, Overall, in general, like uh, extracurricular, do we see that anything changing in that with the county, with the Missoula County Public Schools? You know, you know, I don't see anything changing with regards to regulations or rules or schedules. What we have seen in a couple of our high schools is we've seen uh, entire teams that have been on quarantine because they're considered close contacts. So what that has caused is a delay in their schedule, a postponement of games um, until the team is back off of quarantine. So that has happened. And in fact, um, when I talk about that, those 100, 100 kids a week or 100 kids and staff members a week that are on quarantine, that includes some of those um, sports teams where an entire team has been put on quarantine. Trustee Decker? Thanks. Um, I was struck by the um, comment about the percentage of cases, if we use MCPS as a representation of sort of the whole community, um, like a sort of Missoula writ small, and then the percentage of cases that we would expect to see could be as many as 45. But I'm wondering, of the 9,000 members of the MCPS community, how much of that is students and how much of that is staff? Um, is the staff uh, if you're taking the MOA out of that calculation, are you also taking the MOA staff out of that calculation and like what that looks like? Just because with the ages of people who are having cases, it makes that statistic look a little bit different. Yes, thanks for that, pointing that out, um, Trustee Decker. So it's about 14% about of that number 
of that total number of 9,000 would be staff and the remainder would be students. And it, it would be the in-person staff is what I was calculating. Any other and questions? Can I add one other question too related to staff also? Do you have, I'm sorry, I was talking over you, Trustee Decker, do you have a second question? Um, yes, um, just I know that we had um, heard updates about staffing in the past and about the challenge of, you know, staffing up fully for both the MOA and for the in-person roles, especially including some of our more challenging roles to fill even in normal times, like those lunch duties and substitutes and the hourly so my question is where where we're standing with um, with that and if we're experiencing a more severe staff shortage or if that's improved. And then if people who are hourly, if they have to quarantine, if we are able to pay them um, while they're quarantined. So uh, I'll answer your first question. I'll ask Dave to answer your second question. Um, anecdotally, I've just been starting to talk with principals about how their staffing is going. So I spoke with middle school principals and el elementary principals today and talked about their open positions. Uh, generally at the middle school, they're doing pretty well on staffing. Um, I say that not you know, knowing specifically that there might be a few openings here or there. K-5s are the ones that are still struggling and it's generally in the area of paraeducators. Uh, they have been able to hire some noon duties based on um, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, we did we did sort of a press release and got quite a bit of press around help that we needed with both paras and noon duties. So I think that has generated a few extra applicants, but I know that we're still struggling a bit with um, with para educators and and some of our other positions. And then uh, the question about classified staff and hourly employees and quarantine, I would I would ask Dave to answer that if he if he's comfortable with that. Dave's just moving to a microphone, so there'll be a bit of a delay. Thanks. Under the Families First Act, all of our employees, including the hourly employees, have up to 80 hours of available leave for sick leave. So anybody that was being quarantined would be able to access that leave, which would allow them to continue to be paid during that, uh, that time. So they would receive that. And as uh, uh, Rob alluded to earlier, we really work to try to find work for people if they're in quarantine, if there's ways that they can make, for example, student contacts or other things. We allow them to do that remotely, and then we don't um, deduct those hours from the 80 that they have available. That allows them to continue to maintain some of that balance of hours, and at the same time, make sure that they're addressing and meeting the needs of our students. So we have tried to be as flexible as we possibly can to make sure that they're continuing to get paid so we don't run into positions of trying to hire, you know, uh, for those spots and keep them employed and at the same time meet the needs of the kids. Any other questions on, on this aspect of the update? So it looks like we'll move on to STARS assessment. Yes, so um, again, uh, these were requests for data that the board had uh, made at the last couple of meetings. And so I just was trying to honor those requests. And so we've talked about food service briefly and the mental health services. And I asked Amy Shattuck to give you a, a brief overview of our STAR assessment and she'll explain what the STAR assessment is. Um, it's given three times a year to our students. Uh, we did not give it last spring because our students were not in school. Um, but we did give it this fall, and in fact, we also gave it to our MOA kids this fall. Um, it's generally given in um, grade levels K through 8 and some limited application in grades 9 and 10. Uh, but I think what Amy's going to talk about this evening is some of the grade levels in K through 8. So, Amy, are you ready? Yep. Did you need to share your screen? Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Great. I'm going to share my screen. I apologize to those of you who have already seen this information. Um, here we go. Okay, so um, as Rob um, has talked about, uh, STAR 360 is really our first uh, piece of, of data that we're able to look at this, this year. Um, the seniors this year 
uh, that were supposed to take the ACT in the spring actually took it last week. And so we have some more uh, data coming in for our district. Uh, STAR 360 is, is a tool that we use to assess um, early literacy uh, for kindergarten and first graders and then reading and math. Uh, like Dr. Watson said, uh, second grade through mainly eighth grade and some in ninth. Um, this is given three times a year. Yes, in the fall, winter, and spring. We have our fall and winter from last year, uh, but I think what we really wanted to do was look at kids walking into school last fall as compared to kids walking into school this fall. Uh, and so we'll take a look at some of that in a sec. The early literacy assessment really is for those young, young um, kindergarten and first graders who were looking at their beginning literacy skills and, and moving them towards independence. Um, these, as a district, um, look on this and through this lens, what we're looking for are trends and um, we're not uh, digging real deep into individual schools that is their job but as a district we're really looking at different trends so what uh, we decided to do is just pick a few grade levels at a time um, star 360 has a wonderful tool that they just started this fall it's called schoolzilla and it helps us kind of take that picture and so we're going to look at third grade both ela and math and then I will pause and, and ask for some, if people have questions about it. We're going to look at sixth grade ELA and math as well. And then early lit, we'll put kindergarten and first grade together. And so this, um, I'm going to um, move us on. Amy, I'm this sorry, is Marcia. Can you remind everyone what ELA stands for? Because there are so many acronyms in public or I, education. I apologize. There that, are a lot of acronyms. Um, English language arts is what ELA stands for. Thank you. So the very first uh, little bit of information that we're going to look at is the star reading proficiency rate. And we're using our district benchmark. Our district benchmark is the 40th percentile, um, thinking that 50% is our average. And so 10 points um, either either side is within that average range. Um, I know that some other districts have them set it at uh, different uh, averages, but uh, we have ours set at 40. So if we're looking at, um, this is a really nice tool that helps us look at, at different years as well. We, we started the STAR um, assessment in 2017 with limited participation. 1819 gave us a lot more information and then last fall and this year will be will be really important to watch the trends. So I'm going to start off with third grade and again this is reading and and another thing I think we have to um, remember is that this is just a snapshot, just a dipstick of where these third graders are at this moment in time. And um, so that's why it's really important for us to do three different measurements. So if we're looking at our third graders, and this is third graders across MCPS as well as MOA, um, last fall, our third graders walked in at a 57.3% proficient at or above. Now, I know that this is comparing a little bit of apples to oranges because this group this fall is of course in fourth grade. So what the district is, what we're trying to do is just look at trends. So um, our kids walked in at about 57%. <clears throat> they made some nice growth in the winter and we're up to 71 and i i would predict that in the spring if we had taken it and and the world was normal <laughs> we would be up here um, closer to 80 at, at the proficiency level so um we didn't have that but we what we wanted to see is how did our kids fare during this time and and step into the fall and as you see, our third graders are stepping in at about 65%. What's important about this is that we have to look back at previous years as well. You'll notice that um, 
In the fall of 2018-19, 50% of our third graders walked in per, at or um, above proficiency. They jumped huge to 88%. Um, and then maintained somewhat uh, to the spring. We do see a lot of, of um, growth from that fall to winter. Sometimes we see a little bit of a drop off, but mainly we see it either leveling off or higher. Um, so here third grade, as we're looking at this, um, they ended the year uh, in 2018-19 at 84.5%. So that group, so uh, uh, the group, uh, the following year in last fall, um, before COVID hit, they were walking at a 57.3%. And then in the winter climbed up to 71.5%, which is great. So that's, that's some nice growth. Um, and again, we don't have the spring data, but we wanted to see how third graders are walking in. Know that um, these are second graders from last year. And so they, what this tells me is that they've been able to maintain um, and step into third grade pretty, pretty strong. Uh, we have about 65% at or above proficiency level. This is at the, the reading. Um, and this is just one snapshot of one grade level. Um, I think another interesting um, graph that this school Zilla has is the distribution and and how that measures um, it, it's not just about at and above it really um, delineates the on watch the intervention and the urgent intervention and so this is that information that individual schools go back they do some deep diving into the data find out where the the weaknesses the strengths and and implementing um, interventions for those kids who, who need it or enrichment for those kids who are way above. Um, so this, this um, chart is also available to all principals and, and, and they will use this information for data-driven decision-making at the individual buildings. Any questions about third grade? I'll ask Paul to see if anyone online of the trustees has questions. It looks like not, so no questions right now, Amy. Thanks. Did I move on? Sure, there weren't any questions, so please do. I can't see if anybody's asking any questions. I'm, I'm maybe not speak. talking right into that microphone but there weren't any questions can you hear me yeah I can hear you now yes okay so okay great so I'll I'm going to move on because I don't want to take all this time but um, I'm going to go to sixth grade now knowing that this is that transition year um, for a lot of our uh, our fifth graders moving into sixth grade this is a just a snapshot so uh, the trends look very similar to third grade where they're walking in um, fall tends to be that lower number that's that baseline that we're looking at they make some enormous jumps um, in the winter and tend to either level off or go higher for the spring um, so in the fall of and this is what we were looking at in the fall of of 1920 um, sixth graders were walking in at 66.5 percent, jumped up in the winter, uh, and then this this fall we saw a little bit of a drop um, for sixth graders. Uh, I, I can't give you the reason why that happened, but and it's not a huge significant drop. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, I think is important for you to know is that. For this uh, assessment in the fall of last of 1920, there were 650 kids who were tested um, and, and hit, did the assessment in the fall. This year we have 560 uh, kids. So we have a, a, a drop in kids as well as a drop in, in um, proficiency. Uh, to look at the how it's distributed, I, th I found this really interesting where these kids as a principal, when I was looking at information like this, what I wanted to see were those kind of fringe kids right here where 
where um, they're on watch, um, the interventions and what can we, uh, this is that tier two type of, of interventions. What can we do as an individual building to bring these into to the at or above benchmark? Um, and then of course we have urgent intervention for our about 9% here for the sixth grade. So I know that is what middle school is working on right now. Um, they will be doing data driven dialogues with their teams um, and coming up with an action plan. Um, I think I will move on to math and maybe you can um, hold your questions about reading if, if you have any. So this is math. I'm going to do the same thing. We're going to look at um, third grade overall. Last fall, our third graders walked in at about a 57.6% uh, at or above, and that was 622 kids. They jumped up to 77 uh, in the winter. But then again, we don't have our spring. And then we had a group come in for third grade and and maintained pretty high. That's a 74.6%, which was encouraging. If we look at um, at this information, it looks fairly similar to, to the ELA and reading where they're starting at 61, big jumps, maintain, and then in the fall, um, of course, they're a different group of kids, but a, a lower um, starting point baseline. But this tells us a lot of information to get to this point. Uh, so this is where they're walking in, in the fall. What's going to be really interesting is our next uh, data point, and that'll be in January, the winter window. I'm going to open sixth grade. And so uh, just um, visually, you can see that our sixth graders may be struggling more. Amy, our middle Amy, school I think you have um, all students on there. math ha has just adopted a new program last year. And so it may take uh, some time to um, get kids ready for that, that fall. And so right now at, in 2018, they were sitting at about 69% jumping up, maintaining 67% uh, uh, last fall before COVID hit and ha making some really nice growth. Um, and, and then this fall our sixth graders, uh, it's very similar to ELA, to English language arts, um, kind of dipping in the low 60s. And again, if we look at the distribution, these two groups are, are um, pretty high. And that's, that's that on watch and, and intervention that um, buildings will be focusing on. And Amy, this is um, Marsha. The screen we're looking at says it's all students, not sixth grade students. Wow, sometimes it unclicks it, I apologize. There we go. I'm going to go back to this chart. So it, it's very similar, but this number is even lower. Um, last fall, our sixth graders walked in at a 72.2%. And then um, in the winter climbed up, you don't see the huge growth that you would do in elementary in middle school, but um, what what is concerning is this, and that's the, We've dropped significantly um, in in the area of math and proficiency and kids walking into middle school. Thanks for pointing that out, out Marcia. Um, sometimes it does that. So again, it's it's similar to what I, what I spoke about before is that we have two large groups here. These have, have tended to maintain um, the urgent intervention, but our on watch and intervention group have, have, have grown significantly. Okay, I'm gonna stop before I go to early literacy. Are there any questions about this? Any questions from anybody? And oh, it looks like 
It looks like there are no questions from trustees. Great. Again, early literacy um, is kindergarten and first graders. And so um, I think if we look at these together, like, what we're seeing is that um, our, our, what was that? <laughs> our kids are maintaining, um, they walked in at about 60.7% and then um, jumped up. You, you see some huge jumps in, in, in kindergarten and, and first grade. Um, but and I, I'm sure we would have seen some large ones as well come the spring. And then they are all walking in at about 60%. Um, and, and so that's encouraging. Uh, and that's at the early literacy. So that that is looking at um, early literacy skills. Uh, it, it has some math thrown in there, so it's a little mixture. But really, what you're looking at um, is is those early literacy skills. Look at distribution. Looks very similar to the fall of 2019-2020 to this to this year, this fall. So that's just, again, that's just a snapshot of <clears throat> three different grade levels. I can dig into to multiple grade levels, compare them um, side by side, but I just wanted to give you guys a, a good kind of um, umbrella look at the district. And then um, I, I meet with the individual buildings to create an action plan within their PLCs to move the, that, that needle up. Any questions? Any questions? Did you see any? I, it looks like not. It was very thorough and it was a pretty fascinating snapshot. So thank you for sharing that. All right. And the last thing I just, uh, as I put in the agenda, I wanted to give an update about the MOA and spoke with uh, Ray Cooper. She's our MOA principal uh, this afternoon. And uh, she reports that MOA is in week six of their instruction. Uh, she also is reporting that it's getting a little smoother every week. They've uh, taken some of the comments and feedback that they've received from students and parents, and they're trying to in integrate some changes based on those comments. Um, synchronous instruction, uh, which synchronous means live instruction so the teacher and the students are on the screen at the same time uh, she reports that's going really well um, she's done some drop-ins on various classes and uh, is really impressed with what she's seeing with moa um, instruction uh, they are following our schedule so they will also have parent conferences in november um, and then as i reported earlier they also took the star assessment um, so the numbers that amy just reported includes any MOA students that also participated in STAR. So that's it. I, I chatted about our confirmed cases, uh, our food service numbers, mental health. Thank you, Ginny, for helping explain the mental health services and the participation. Uh, Amy did a great job with STAR, and I wanted to give you an MOA update. Um, the purpose for just sharing this information is Frequently in the in these discussions that we've been having about our what our in-person schedule looks like These are some of the questions that have come up. So I thought it was important to to get the the board up to speed on those topics So thank you for your interest in your participation So Based on this it's an information only item. Are there any um, overall questions from any trustee about the information we received? Just Oh, Trustee Sturbis, I see your hand is up. Uh, yeah, I would say I really appreciate all this information. Um, but what I want to know is, uh, I don't know if the task force is working on this or whatever, but our motion uh, at the last meeting was that we would move from the hybrid model when cases were either uh, declining or steady. Um, and so I still haven't seen any information about what metrics we're going to use to decide to move from the hybrid plan. Just, um, 
Superintendent Watson was just taking notes for a second, so I'll. Yep. Uh, thank you, Trustee Sturbis, for the question. That is something that we've been talking about with the task force. We have not uh, gotten that detail yet, but that was brought up on Monday, just yesterday, um, with the county health office. So what happens on our task force meetings is that the county health officer on Monday um, sort of gives us an update on, on current cases in the county and then provides um, just a question and answer. And that was brought up in the task force by one of the task force members about metrics regarding um, you know, moving between phases. And so I know the county health officer is going to be thinking about that before next Monday. So it has been a topic. We don't have any um, answers there yet, but it has been a topic at the task force. Any other, whoops, any other questions for Dr. Watson? Trustee Decker? Thanks. Um, I have been getting the question from a lot of folks about what the plans are around the MOA after the first semester. Um, and I've been sharing the information as best as I know it, but I thought it would be good to share it in this forum if you would be able to let people know where we are right now, even if that answer is we don't know until we know about more funding from another source. Uh, so I guess yes. the question is, what do we know about MOA past the first semester? Yeah, thank you. I also receive that question um, quite frequently. And we, we don't have an answer yet after first semester. Uh, we are um, still um, looking at funding sources and, and seeing how we can make that work. Um, but we don't have an answer yet after first semester. Any other questions from trustees? Seeing none, I don't know if any trustees have any board comment. Not seeing any hands up. It's information only, but we typically ask for any public comment um, on information items as well. Currently, I'm not seeing any hands up. Are you, Paul? No. Okay, so with that, we'll return to the agenda for the next item, which is under new business for finance and operations, and it is to approve the Sealy Swan Environmental Review Checklist and the Environmental Review Form and Resolution 2021-3S. And I have to say, I think there's maybe two people at the table that would understand this. One's an engineer and one's an... Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, this is this is part of our uh, delivering local assistance grant that was uh, this was awarded through the Department of Commerce. Uh, it's uh, used to help fund our uh, 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 piping project up at Sealy Lake, and uh, part of that grant um, that uh, the funding of that grant is subject to the Montana Environmental Review Policy Act. And under that act, there's three different areas of review um, based upon the potential impact. And so the levels of review are, are uh, exempt uh, environmental assessment and then envir environmental impact statement. Uh, what we've attached to the agenda beginning on page 92 really forms our environmental assessment. And that environmental assessment essentially states that we don't need to do an environmental impact statement. Um, so I, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but if you go to page 101, um, under question three, and this environmental review form is incorporated within the environmental checklist, and, and this form was, uh, uh, and the checklist were prepared uh, um, by Burley McWilliams with assistance from our uh, construction engineers, whole thing. Um, and as referenced in response to question three, uh, we do not believe an environmental impact statement is required because the scope of this project does not, does not present an opportunity for impacts to the environment. Essentially, all of the checklist questions that begin on page 92 are efforts to uh, determine uh, and ascertain impact, environmental impact. And you'll see if you look through the checklist on the on the 
the left side for each question, there's a letter, and the letter reflects um, a response, and the letter N, which is primarily the response, is, is no impact. Um, and then you'll see there's some other impacts, potentially beneficial and mitigation required. And so as an example, if you look on question one, it talks about um, geological constraints and replacing uh, existing water under this pro program uh, inside the building um, doesn't have any impacts in terms of topographic or geologic constraints. These types of questions are, are uh, identified th throughout. Um, question four uh, talks about ground groundwater resource and aquifers um, and their impact. And then our response is that the, uh, with replacements of the pipes, there's a potential benefit as there's less uh, lead um, in the water that's going down the drains into the septic systems. Um, so as, as you follow through these various questions, the other point in, in presenting these to the board is that the board uh, is required to adopt this as the environmental assessment. When I say this, it's the environmental checklist plus the environmental review. We would then submit that to the department for their determination that this is sufficient for us to move forward um, uh, in the grant process. And so um, the other point in presenting this and providing this in, in, to the board is that it provides the public an opportunity to, to review and respond. And, um, and with, with the primary response as being no impact to the environment based upon the type of project that's being performed, um, we didn't anticipate any public comment or any adverse public comment. Um, and so the resolution that's on page 103 indicates that the checklist was presented and included the environmental review form, that uh, they are both attached to the agenda, which is a public meeting, and that there wasn't substantive comment in regards to the, to the checklist. So uh, presuming there's no um, uh, public comment in opposition, we would submit this uh, to the department as our environmental assessment. Um, I'm, I'm happy to walk through each of the questions. Uh, as I mentioned, I didn't prepare the answers, but I've read through those, and I, I feel like the main response was was in the review form in particular the item to question the response to question number number three but happy to answer any questions you might have oh sorry thank you Sorry about that. Um, the occasional technical difficulty we always seem to have. I'm looking forward to moving into a boardroom that might have a little bit better sound system, so to speak. Um, any questions for Pat? I'm not seeing hands up. I have one procedural question just about um, the recommendation. Do we have to... Let me just grab it. It, the recommendation is to approve the environmental review checklist and the environmental review form, but there's also a resolution that's attached. Is the resolution not something the board considers, but if we take these two other actions, the resolution is, is self-actuating? I just, I didn't understand that. Yeah, you know, we should have, as part of the action, asked the board to approve the resolution, so that should be included. And I guess I would point out, um, just on a side note, that the project is about 99% done. So um, we're, we're looking really good in terms of the progress of the project. The, this is the step that we need to take place in order to, uh, to uh, request a reimbursement under the terms of the grant. So. Any other requests or questions? So the... Um, amended recommendation is that there is a motion to approve the environmental review checklist, the environmental review form, and res resolution 2021-3S. Is there a motion to do so? 
Moved by Trustee Lorenzen. Is there and second by Trustee Avgaris? Is there any board discussion? I'll just say thanks to Burley and to Holtang for compiling this information and making sure that we will get reimbursed for this project. So if you can pass along the thanks for the amount of detail that it took to complete the assessment. Is there any public comment? Or any other board comment first? I'm not seeing any hands up. Then all trustees in favor of the motion to improve the environmental review checklist, environmental review form, and resolution 2021-3S, please indicate by raising your hand. Or in um, Trustee Bogle's case, would you um, indicate by voting yes or no? Bogle is yes. And so that passes unanimously as to all trustees present. Now we come to approving transportation route mileage changes. And it looks, we see this throughout the school year, basically. Is that correct, Pat? So you're going to give us um, an update on why this particular route is route changes are coming in? Yes, thank you. So this is, this is essentially uh, the mileage for the routes that are approved by the board. Then we bring it to the transportation committee um, for approval tomorrow, and then that's submitted to, to the OPI for calculation of the reimbursement, the state and county reimbursement. So this reflects our first semester of mileage for each of the routes listed, uh, beginning on page 104. Um, and the, the 104 and 105 are regular transportation routes, and then pages 106 and 107 are special education routes, and this is for all the routes that we're currently operating. And um, the, on page 104, the highlighted two routes represent the, the Sealy routes. Um, so that's why they're, they're, they're shaded about uh, two thirds of the way down the page. Any, any questions for Pat? I have a question. I don't know if there's any way to tell. Has the routes been impacted in terms of running less routes, more routes, or just different routes because of all the changing factors of, in terms of more, you know, some. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because there has been impact and, and we last year ran 94 regular routes and we're at 78 regular routes this year. Um, those regular routes though are running at uh, more hours so there's uh, 55 additional hours per day based upon those um, those routes and the adjustment to those routes so um, and then the special education routes are less and the ridership is is less the mileage on the regular routes is real consistent with last year for those particular routes that the um, that are listed, but the there's there's been drop off on the, the special education routes as as you might expect based upon the the students that are in the schools. Okay, I'm back on. We're we have dueling microphones apparently on this side of the table. <laughs> Apologies to those listening at home. Any other board questions for Pat? Not seeing any hands raised. So the recommendation is that there is a motion to approve the bus route mileage changes for the 2020-2021 year as reflected in the attachment to the agenda. Is that correct? Is there a motion to approve the bus route mileage changes for 2020-2021? Moved by Trustee Abgaris. Is there a second? Second by Trustee Lorenzen. Is there any board discussion? Is there any public comment? Not seeing any, then all trustees in favor of the motion to approve the bus route mileage changes for 2020 through 2021 school year, please indicate by raising your hand. And it looks like it's unanimous as to all trustees present. 
and then we move on to the personnel report and the item is to approve the personnel report and I noticed Dave at the top of the report it says elementary and it looks like everyone that's listed is elementary but it's listed as an elementary secondary action it's, both. it's both okay great so is there anything um, of note to and mr. Rod is shaking his head no he's the head of HR so that's why we always check with him to see if there's anything he wants to make known about the um, personnel report we usually see them almost every single month every so often there's a bit of a leg but any trustees have any questions of a general nature we don't comment on specific individuals on the personnel report see no questions then the recommendation is that the trustees approve the item on the provided personnel report is there such a motion moved by trustee Abgaris and seconded by trustee Lorenzen is there any board discussion see none is there any public comment and again we only comment on general um, generally but not on specific individuals on the personnel report I'm not seeing any hands up so all trustees in favor of the item to the motion to approve the items on the provided personnel report please indicate by raising your hand and trustee Bogle, Bogle is yes. thanks so that passes unanimously then we reach item number 10 which is the board of trustee vacant position that we have so if the board and the public can bear with me um, dr. Watson and I worked uh, um, for quite a while today to figure out a process because surprisingly at last board meeting we had no applicants and now we have 11 mm -hmm. and so it's it's a number that I myself being on the board hasn't dealt with in the past and so just a couple of things to check on first it would appear with that number a special board meeting would be a better use of everyone's time rather than trying to add it onto a regular board meeting so I just wanted to do a survey would trustees be available from say 6 to 8 on Thursday October 22nd for a zoom special board meeting is there anyone who can't make it I'm just raise your hand raise your hand if you can't make it trustee Abgaris can't make it that night okay and we'll have to check with trustee McDonald and trustee Mercer but I think since we will have a Oh, and trustee Decker you can't make it so we're that's down three yes I, I could make it at 6 30 not at 6 Do we need to be careful of having an elementary board quorum no I checked with um, both state MTSBA and um, our local council and it's a, an all trustees vote on it matter so it we would need a quorum of the board which would be seven so um, if we shift it to 630 we would gain one more board member would that be okay with everybody for Thursday October 22nd at 630 instead of six and I'm just checking in I don't see share or trustee Sturbus indicating she couldn't make that time and trustee wake can you make that time yes okay thanks so can you hear me? okay so 6 30 instead of 6 on Thursday October 22nd it will be a zoom meeting it seems to be the platform that's going to be the most manageable given the number of candidates right now and so just to walk everyone through what's happened in my past experience about when there's an, a vacancy on the board we've had anywhere between about six to five to five to six questions because there's only been usually two to three people who were being asked questions and we would you know be meeting in person but with the number of candidates what we settled upon was we looked at the questions that were asked at the last vacancy the trustee Bogle had answered and there were five of them and there's a little redundancy in them so we tried to clean up the redundancy and got it down to four questions so the process that we hope to follow and it will go out to the applicants tomorrow is that there will be two written questions 
from the questions that we asked last time with slight modifications that we'll ask them to respond in writing by noon on Monday it's via email. You, know, you can drop it off, but there'll be an electronic place for them to email their responses to those two questions to Tracy in the administrative office. And they are, please describe what you see as the responsibilities of the board versus the responsibilities of the superintendent. How would you foster a good working relationship with the administration? That's one. The second one is, what do you believe to be the strengths of MCPS district and what do you consider as areas to review or possibly change? So those were questions asked in previous interviews. And then we did want to put a caveat in because we would like to have them in by noon so we can get the agenda out and comply with the notice component to the Open Meetings Act. So we're going to put just a caveat on the request for the written questions that if you fail to submit them in a timely fashion, that would be taken into consideration in considering your application just to encourage that timely submission. And then we've got two questions for the in-person meeting and they are what skills and abilities, including any prior board experience you have that would serve you in the district well in your service as a school board trustee. And the second one is, what is your understanding of your role as an individual trustee where you are part of an 11 member board? So that's the questions we'd be asking via the Zoom meeting. And then just to be, um, it, we couldn't think of a fair way, alphabetically, front, first name, last name, alphabetical. We're, we are literally going to have Tracy put all the names in a hat or something and draw them out, and then we will give notice to the candidates that this is the order in which we will be asking the questions, and then we will also do it in two blocks, like block A for five to six people, and then in the second hour, block B, just so if people don't want to sit for the whole two hours, they can plan. But everyone, including the public, is welcome to be on the Zoom call for the whole time. So unless there's any significant objections from the trustees or any questions of me, that's what we hope to accomplish. And, and all this information will go out to the candidates tomorrow, right, Tracy? Okay. Oh. Trustee Decker. Thanks. My question is, after the candidates have answered the questions in writing and in person, can you remind me what the process is from there as to how they're actually selected from that pool? Sure. That's, as everyone always says, when it is a great question, that's a great question. And so, you know, because we have to comply with the Open Meeting Act, I did talk to um, Megan today, one of our board attorneys, and so the the, basically, the deliberations happen in a, in you know, kind of an awkward fashion. But after we've heard from everyone, then before we can discuss the strengths and weaknesses of any candidate, we need a motion on the floor with a second to discuss whether or not whoever is identified should be the trustee who fills the vacancy. And of course, if that particular candidate doesn't get a majority of the votes, then we consider a second motion. Does, does that make sense? So just as we've had, just as um, you know, the legal rules that apply to all motion open meeting acts, we need some action on the table before we can hold a discussion or take public comment on it. It doesn't mean that that motion necessarily is going to pass, but it starts the process by which we make a decision. And so we will continue to deliberate in that fashion until a candidate has been identified and received um, a, vote, a majority of the board's vote to fill the vacant seat. Anyone else have questions or, okay, I see Trustee Decker's hands up. Trustee Lorenzen. I, I guess what you just described seems really random. And so I guess we can't have more of an open conversation of like pick a top three or anything we just have to go straight to putting a name on the table before we can talk I suppose if someone wanted to put a motion on the table that we consider that these as the top three candidates and move on from there I I will double check with our legal counsel but that could be a viable viable alternative it's just you know I didn't think of that because we've never had more than a handful of candidates before but I will confirm with Bia or Megan if that's an option because I know that's in part what we did 
with the superintendent search too. And, so. And then is there any way we can, it just seems really hard to listen to 11 people and then pick one. <laughs> you know, there's no time, uh, it's not like we, there's nothing we can have ahead of time, right? Or is there something we can have ahead of time? Well, that's why we decided to break out the, I mean, normally we would ask, be asking at least four questions. So that's why we've asked the candidates to answer two of the questions in writing, which all, everyone, the, they'll be part of the agenda, so the public and we will see them. And that seemed to be a, a, a more efficient use of everyone's time, both the candidates and us. So, and yes, I, I'm... And it, yeah, so what will be, and whatever they submitted as their letter of interest, some people send in letters of interest and resumes and kind of short articles, then the two answers to the written questions is what everyone will have as an attachment to the agenda. And so I wanted to also give all the candidates the questions they'll be asked in person so they can be thoughtful about their answers because I know when I've been in an interview where you don't know what the questions are, Sometimes you'd kind of filibuster for a second or two to kind of wrap your head around the qu how to answer it. And I thought it's much more efficient if you know what the questions are going to be and you come in prepared. And so because of the number of candidates, I, that seemed fairer than trying to um, surprise them with questions, which we haven't done recently, but it has been done on other boards. I checked with legal counsel. So that's why I wanted to do it that way. But thank you for pointing out there can be other motions made. So does that seem, if I'm not seeing any opposition to that process and the time, then we'll go ahead and move forward tomorrow with this. Not seeing anyone making any comments. And this is just um, procedural information, so I wouldn't normally be taking public comment on this. We would take, obviously, public comment during the special board meeting. And so with that, we've reached the point where we're at public comment again on non-agenda items. And so is there any indication from anyone in the meeting on Zoom who would like to make public comment on a non-agenda item at this point? I don't see any hands up and Paul's just confirmed that. So with that, the meeting is adjourned and thank you all for your time tonight.